chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode is brought to you by Fume. Break your bad habits today with Fume Air Devices. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code DARK to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's tryfume.com and use code DARK to save an additional 10% off your order today. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 14, Episode 2. I'm your host, Otis Gyre, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Brian Martinez, Nick Carlson, and Kisto Healy. Tonight, we'll hear stories of callous corpses, bothersome beans, diaries of despair, and homecoming horrors. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now... It's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down, though, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> It's the great dream. A nice house, beautiful lawn, a place to call your own and to breathe fresh air. Except, of course, there are things that can turn a dream into a nightmare. Take this family, brought to us by Brian Martinez, whose chance to live out in the country and enjoy a device-free existence shows what can happen when you truly get back to nature. Without further ado, I present to you... The Dreadwood. I've always been a city boy. As far back as I could remember, the sounds of traffic and crowds had been ever-present in my life, so much beeping and moving and overlapping conversation. As a kid, I don't think it bothered me much, but as I started to creep into my 40s, getting married to Sarah, having two kids, Christopher, then Jenny, the chaos of city life started to grate on me. It became like television static in the background of every moment, threatening to drown it all out. 
Add in the millions of screens vying for attention, worst of all, the ones right in our pockets, plus the neighbors stacked on top of one another like filing cabinets, and I began to feel like life was passing me by. A deafening express train straight to the grave. Most likely, I would have just put up with it, maybe bought some nice headphones and taken up meditation, except that one day Sarah made an offhand comment that got lodged in my brain, replaying on a loop. It was just after the teacher of Jenny's fifth grade class died. One Saturday, we received the message that Mrs. Beckham had been hit by a truck. She'd been out walking when a truck driver didn't see her because he was texting. Jenny was devastated, as any ten-year-old would have been, more so because she'd always been a sensitive kid, precocious and curious. Mrs. Beckham's death hit her especially hard. After we'd calmed her down and answered all her questions, we let her play quietly in her bedroom while we retreated to the living room. Poor kid, I said, falling onto the couch. I felt drained after having to break Jenny's heart while still maintaining a calm exterior. I can't imagine what the other parents are going through. Well, some kids take it easier than others, Sarah said, joining me on the couch and huddling up next to me. Some of them don't really understand the finality of these things. I remember thinking my grandfather was just going on a long vacation. Not Jenny, I said. No, not her. Sometimes I feel like she understands more than we do. Remember when she gave that bee a funeral? I tried to smile at the memory. Jenny was just eight at the time, dressed in every black item of clothing she owned, reading a poem to the planter where she insisted we'd bury the bee. But the smile died in my face. All I could think of was Mrs. Beckham, a woman who Jenny had adored, dying a needless death because a hurried driver couldn't take the time to wait for a traffic light to pull out their phone. Sarah must have seen it on my face. She laid her head on my shoulder and dug in closer to my side. Honestly, I don't think we were meant to live like this, she sighed. That was it. That was the phrase that echoed in my head day after day, hour after hour. A week later, I started my search for a new place we could call home, somewhere back to basics without the trappings of modern life, ones that had taken the life of our daughter's teacher and that felt like it was doing the same to us in small doses. After a good amount of searching, I found a gorgeous house in a forested area called Southern Pines. It was secluded enough to be away from traffic and noisy neighbors, yet only a 15-minute drive to the nearest stores and a 20-minute drive to one of the best schools in the state. When I presented it to Sarah, explaining that I could do my architecture work anywhere on the internet, I was thrilled to find she liked the idea. Jenny did, too, especially when we told her it would be like living in a fairy tale with birds and deer outside her window. Christopher, being a every bit of 15, fought us about it in every expected way and even a few new ones. In the end, we promised to buy him a truck for his 16th birthday, and after that, every argument magically dissolved. When we began the drive up the Southern Pines with every belonging of ours packed into the car, I couldn't help but feel a mixture of excitement and apprehension. It was meant to be our sanctuary, a place where we could escape the relentless pace of city life, and yet everything about it was unknown to us. Look at the trees! Jenny exclaimed from the back seat, craning out the window to look at the massive pines overhead. The forest was old growth, barely touched by man, and some of the trees looked like they must have been 200 feet tall. Christopher, of course, was less than impressed. You know why they call it Southern Pines? He leaned over to Jenny, his voice dripping with sarcasm. Let me guess, Sarah said from the passenger seat. Is it because your life is going south? Or, I suggested, because crap runs downhill. I looked at Christopher in the rear view. He was silent, 
glancing from Sarah to me with an incredulous look, like we just pulled a rabbit from our ears. Sarah gave me a knowing smile before turning back. Your generation didn't invent being a smart-ass kiddo. Neither did ours, actually. We just perfected it. Especially your mom, I added. Christopher cracked a smile, though when we saw his eyes in a rear view, he tried to hide it. We reached the turn from the main road onto the private dirt road. If it wasn't for the old broken mailbox mounted by the entrance, I would have missed it entirely, as I did the first time Sarah and I checked the place out. The dirt road was bumpy, with a few especially rough patches, but five minutes later we came out the other end to the site of our new house. The house was an old two-story cottage made from honey-colored pine. It had seen better days, and yet it had held up remarkably for being as old as it was. Green ivy snaked and crawled up its outer walls, blending it with its woodland surrounds. A stone path led through a garden and up to the front door, all shadowed by the massive oaks surrounding it. More importantly, though, it was quiet. Better than quiet. The air was filled with the gentle rustling of leaves combined with the melodies of songbirds nested in their canopy. As the kids ran up to the house, Sarah and I caught each other's eyes and smiled at each other. We were home with a new life ahead of us. After giving the kids a tour and hauling our things inside, we had a quick lunch of ham and cheese sandwiches while we discussed everything we had to do in the coming days. In the morning, I planned to call someone about installing a satellite for internet, not just for work, but for everyone's sanity. We may have been getting back to nature, but we didn't exactly plan to live like the Amish. At some point, I found myself on the front porch, staring into the dense woods surrounding us. The trees beckoned me, an alluring mystery I couldn't resist, and yet an unsettling feeling fell over me the deeper I looked. I must have been gone a while because eventually Christopher came out to find me. Uh, Mom said to quit daydreaming and help us unpack. Well, that does sound like your mom, I replied. He joined me on the deck, father and son, a moment I'd been looking forward to for some time. Soon we were both staring into the woods silently, side by side. There was something about the trees that was mesmerizing. Eventually, Christopher broke the silence. Could we chop down a tree, he asked, and I couldn't help but chuckle. I'd have to buy an axe first. Shouldn't we have one anyway, like for firewood? Good thinking. The city folk have some learning to do. I mussed up his hair, and he pulled away half laughing. We have to be nice to them, Jenny suddenly said, making both of us jump. She hadn't made a sound as she opened the door and came right up behind us. Who? Christopher asked, annoyed at her as usual. The trees. I smiled and bent down, making myself her height. It's only the dead ones we use for firewood, sweetie. The live ones don't burn very well. As long as we don't hurt them, they don't like that. My daughter never stopped amazing me. She had more empathy than all of us combined, room enough for all the trees and animals, and even the bugs, though she kept a distance from those. I promise I won't hurt the trees, I assured her. Sarah appeared at the door then, hair messy and hands full. I was wondering where everyone went. I'd been in there unpacking by myself. I stood back up, holding Jenny close. What do you say we go for a little walk? Explore the area. Yeah, Jenny said. I shrugged at Sarah, waiting for her answer. I knew she wanted to focus on unpacking and setting up the house, but it felt like we all needed a breath of fresh air to wake us up after the long drive. We still have a lot to do, Sarah said. I playfully pulled her out the door and onto the porch. That's what tomorrow's for, I said. And the next day. Please, Mom? Jenny begged. Yeah, please? Christopher added. Even you? She shook her head at me, knowing that Christopher would agree to anything that got him out of doing work. Then she smiled. All right, sure. What if we get lost and can't get back, Jenny asked. And a look of doubt crossed everyone's faces. 
Luckily, I'd been doing a lot of reading to prepare us for living in the woods. Let me show you a little trick. I ran inside and opened the box I knew had all of our Christmas supplies, rummaging through until I found what I was looking for. I re-emerged from the house, brandishing a spool of bright red ribbon and a small pair of scissors. That's your big trick? Christopher asked. No, it's my small trick. And small tricks are better than big tricks. I snipped off a length of red ribbon, then walked to the nearest tree and tied the ribbon around one of the lower branches. See? Then we just follow the trail right back here. Easy. Because it works so well for Hansel and Gretel, Sarah ribbed me. That was breadcrumbs. Luckily, birds don't eat ribbon. He doesn't like it, Jenny said. Who? Sarah asked. The tree. Sarah smiled. It's not that tight. Besides, I'm sure he doesn't want us to get lost, does he? Jenny shrugged, either not knowing the answer or not liking it. With that, we set off on our first adventure into the woods, Jenny and Christopher walking just ahead of us while Sarah and I followed behind. Every hundred feet or so, I'd cut a length of ribbon and tie it to a tree branch, making sure to keep a clean line of sight from one to the next, or at least to the best of my ability. The forest was dense in parts, and the easiest direction to walk wasn't always obvious. It was a beautiful walk with the family. Finally, I'd found peace I'd been looking for, the escape from the rat race and all the racket that came with it. There wasn't a scrap of metal or plastic in sight. Sarah and I walked hand in hand while Jenny excitedly called out every bird and squirrel she spotted to make sure we saw them too. Even Christopher, who was normally unimpressed with every vacation we'd ever taken, seemed to be enjoying himself. But at some point, I couldn't tell you when exactly, the forest stopped being southern pines and started to become something else. The air progressively grew heavier, not with the heat, but with the substance, until we could feel the weight of it pressing down on our shoulders. I was surprised to see the daylight waning so early, only to realize it was the canopy above us becoming thicker, blocking out more and more sunlight until the afternoon looked like night. A sense of unease grew in all of us, but Jenny, by far, was the most nervous. She began to walk by Sarah's side, tugging at her and asking if we could turn around. A few more minutes, Sarah reassured her, but then Jenny started to tremble, something terrible. She seemed to understand the danger we were all in, even if the rest of us didn't. Okay, Sarah said, throwing me a concerned look. Let's turn back. We can resume the expedition some other time. Hold on, I said, raising a finger for everyone to be quiet. I had heard something in the woods ahead. It sounded like a rustle in the fallen leaves, but much larger than the scurrying of small animals we'd been hearing. The four of us stood silently, not moving a limb as we trained our ears on our surroundings. Christopher was the first to spot it. He pointed to a grouping of trees and silently mouthed the words, It's a deer. It broke the tension, but only briefly. Quiet as we could, the four of us crept forward to get a better look at it, though I could see Jenny trying to pull Sarah back by the hand. She knew the truth before we did. You see, the more I looked at it, the more I became convinced it wasn't a deer at all. At first glance, it had the familiar silhouette of one, brown fur, wide chest, long legs, and a large set of antlers on top of its head. The first thing that I noticed wasn't quite right were the legs. They were bent at odd angles, at times almost in reverse, and when the animal moved, it did so in jerks and twitches. I whispered for everyone to get back to start walking the way we'd come, but as quiet as I said it, the deer, or whatever it actually was, must have heard me. It turned its head in my direction staring directly at me with eyes that were almost human. The antlers on top of its head seemed to be moving and undulating, like hands flexing, reaching out to me, beckoning me. The breath caught in my throat. If I'd been by myself, I would have turned and run as hard as I could, 
but I had a family to protect, so I kept calm and urged them back as quietly as I could without betraying the terror that had moved into my chest. We moved quickly, but I never stopped checking behind us to make sure that animal, that thing, wasn't following us. Thank God for the ribbons I'd tied, otherwise I don't think I could have thought clearly enough to find our way back. Eventually, the woods around us grew lighter and more airy, and I think we all realized then how different the area we'd wandered into had truly been. Ten minutes after that, we got back to the house. We went inside, with none of us mentioning a word of what had just happened. I don't even know how much they'd seen of the animal or felt in the air. That night, I drove to town and bought an axe. We'd been living in the house for two weeks, unpacking, settling in, figuring out this new life of ours when disaster found us. I had just pulled into the driveway for a supply run when Sarah came rushing out of the house looking scattered. She caught me just as I was stepping out. Christopher's gone, she said nervously. Her face looked tight and panicked like skin stretched over bone. What do you mean, gone? He's, uh, he's not in the house or in the back. I can't find him anywhere. I ran around the back and checked for him, then each room of the house, calling out his name in case he'd been hiding or playing a trick on us. As I did, I almost missed spotting the clue to where Christopher had gone. The ribbon was missing from where I'd left it, as was a small pair of scissors. I remembered then that Christopher had been asking questions about the area of the woods that we'd stumbled into two weeks since. He couldn't let it go, even though I urged him to. He was too young, too curious, and it had led him directly into the path of trouble. I told Sarah about the missing ribbon, and it did nothing to settle her nerves. Then we'll all go look for him, she said, grabbing a coat. No, you and Jenny stay here at the house in case he comes back. She didn't like it, but she agreed it was a good idea, especially not bringing Jenny along or leaving her alone. But when I grabbed the axe, the look on her face only intensified. You never know, I said. She nodded, holding back tears. It only took me a minute to find the first red ribbon I'd tied two weeks earlier. Looking back, I wished I'd removed them on our hurried walk back to the house. But at the time, I wasn't in the right mind to think of it. In not doing so, I'd given my son a clear path right back to where we'd seen that unnatural creature. Be careful, Sarah told me. I kissed her and told her I would. Then I set out, me and the axe, following the red ribbons through the forest. Just like the first time, the woods were beautiful and pristine and full of sunlight filtering down through the canopy for much of the walk. More of it this time, actually. It was as if the forest had shifted somehow, changed configurations. I didn't cross into that colder, darker place until much later in the walk. I was sure of it. It didn't make sense, but I couldn't argue with what I was feeling. Soon I reached the last ribbon I remembered tying, not far from where we'd spotted the deer-like beast. I kept my eye out for it, praying I didn't see it again. I didn't, but what I did see made my heart leap, because it confirmed I was on the right path. A new ribbon was tied to a tree up ahead. It was lower, the knot messier. Christopher had tied it there. I knew it without a doubt. I wasn't happy with him going into the woods on his own, but I was grateful, beyond words, that he'd used the ribbon like I'd shown him. I followed the path of new ribbons, the woods growing colder and heavier with each step. There were noises all around me, some like whispers, other like chewing and grunting. I gripped my axe tightly and continued on for Christopher's sake. Eventually, the ribbons led to a clearing of old trees tangled with dead vines. At the center stood an ancient, gnarled tree, its twisted roots coiling into the earth like serpents suckling its blood. There, lying on the ground against its knotted trunk, were the scissors and spool of red ribbon. I picked them up almost to check if they were real, and could swear they still felt warm to the touch. Whispers suddenly filled my ears. It was a language I didn't know or recognize, and it came at me in overlapping voices. My head swam with them, threatening to throw me to the ground. Darkness fell like a blanket trying to smother me. I looked around and realized I was trapped. The trees had closed in so tightly that there was no path, no way out. 
I hacked away at the nearest tree with the axe, but I barely made a dent in its thick bark, as if it was resisting me. The voices grew louder until they converged into one. The language sounded ancient, formless, and though I couldn't make out any of the words, somehow I understood the meaning. The boy is ours. No, I begged, the axe dropping from my hand. I don't know who you are, but he's... He's just a kid. You can take me if you want, but let him go. Please. You are ours. I realized what it meant, that I couldn't use myself to bargain since I was already trapped, already theirs. I'll do anything, trade anything, just let him go. My family is all I have. For unending seconds, I waited for an answer. Finally, I got one. The trade is given. Thank you, I cried. A moment later, the trees parted with a great creaking and tearing of roots. One of them spread its vines to reveal Christopher held inside it, filthy and unconscious, clutching some kind of book. I ran to him, scooped him out, carrying him in my arms away from that place. Only once did I look back, just a glance, just long enough to see what looked like a deer standing on its hind legs, antlers outstretched. The entire run back, I only ever paused to remove the red ribbons from the trees. Halfway back, Christopher woke up and was able to walk on his own feet. Eventually, we found our way home, emerging battered from the forest. We'd just barely escaped with our lives, and we knew this. And yet somehow, the worst was yet to come. My heart dropped when I saw the back door of the house sitting wide open. Inside, we found a mess of broken glass and knocked over chairs, signs of a struggle. Most telling of all, a few dead leaves were scattered on the floor next to what looked like part of a muddy hoof print. In a panic, Christopher and I searched the house, but we already knew in our hearts what we would find. Sarah and Jenny were gone. The trade was given. We tried to find that clearing countless times, but never could. Never even felt close. I wish I'd left the ribbons tied in place on the way back. Thought about it every night as I lay in bed, but in truth is, I don't know if it would have helped anyway. The forest moves as it wishes, does as it wishes, takes what it wishes. The book Christopher had been clutching out turned it to be a diary he'd found in the woods just before he was taken. I read it cover to cover more times than I can count. A man who wrote it was seeking a place called the Dreadwood that sounded awfully like what we'd seen. Based on the way it ends abruptly, I would say he found it. These days, Christopher and I spend our days searching the forest, hardly speaking except about the search. You might ask, why don't I move away? Why don't I take my son away from South Pines? And more importantly, the Dreadwood. But the answer is simple. We still have so much ribbon left. Some habits are harder to break than others. Me, I just recently made the habit to bury victims deep enough that their zombies don't interrupt my dinner routine. But sometimes I just don't give myself the time I need. Well, you probably know that certain bad habits can be tough to break, especially cold turkey, because you start getting anxious, fidgety, and you don't have anything comforting to fall back on. That's why I recommend Fume, a better way to break your habit because it gets rid of the bad part of the habit and makes change fun and exciting. No vapors, no electronics, no harmful chemicals. Fume's an air device with a handsome wood and metal design well-balanced and perfect for anxious hands. And what I love about it is the air cores. Simple, like an herbal tea, instead of the sticky soda feel other products offer. And in flavors like orange vanilla, crisp mint, sparkling grapefruit, and more. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. 
perfume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code DARK to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code DARK to save an additional 10% off your order today. I hope you enjoyed The Dreadwood by Brian Martinez, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help him by supporting him at simplyscarypodcast.com slash brian martinez. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash b-r-i-a-n dash m-a-r-t-i-n-e-z. He has many more tales for your enjoyment, both on creepypastastories.com, his own website at bloodstreamcity.com, and perhaps very, very soon, here as well. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. We also wanted to remind you that you too might have your chance to appear on Scary Stories Told in the Dark. We're accepting submissions of written work roughly 3,000 to 4,000 words in length with a maximum of 5,250. Any perspective is fine. First, second, third, or even the elusive fourth person, if you can find it. But please be aware that if you use first person, make sure the character fits my dulcet tones. We're looking for anything spooky, scary, uh, that will make you shiver. But if you've listened for some time, you may notice that we try to keep language, the sensual stuff, and gore to a reasonable standard. If you think that sounds like your opportunity, please send us in your stories to writing contest at simplyscarypodcast.com by November 12th, and we'll announce the winners to appear on an upcoming episode. See? Take it from me. Never ever try to get away from electronic devices and get back to a simpler time. Nature is definitely out to get you. and You should stay indoors and listen to podcasts all day long. It's the safe thing to do. I highly recommend it. You know what else is probably a good idea to avoid? Farming. Well, wait. Maybe not as a whole. I do like my corn and the cob, after all. But as Nick Carlson's about to show us, weeds are a problem in agriculture, and should you encounter any, maybe it's best to consult a manual before you do any pruning. You might find that a green thumb is something you don't want to have. Without further ado, I present to you Mandragora. Byron's mother had always warned him to stay away from strange plants. Of course, that was back in his childhood days, when anything green and leafy was poison ivy. And decades' worth of expertise on his end, plus decades' worth of mental decline on his worrywart mother's end, had encouraged Byron to branch out and take his own approach to nature, a more curious, exploratory one, hands-on and tangible, with caution as a guidepost, not a motivator. Yet that old axiom echoed in his mind for the first time in years as he regarded the ghastly sight before him. His rooster, Corn Pop, It'd gone missing a few nights earlier. Byron had assumed it was the fox again, but the hen house bore no signs of a struggle, and the ground, softened by a rainy weekend, revealed no concerning tracks. Therefore, he could only assume the bird had wandered off from the flock into the surrounding forest, which was even stranger behavior for a ladies' man such as Corn Bob. By the fifth day, Byron was already making plans to buy a new rooster the next time he was out, but what he had found in the woods during his weekly rounds put a damper on those plans. The rooster's body was emaciated, strewn almost casually across the semi-beaten path Byron had forged over the years. 
His abdomen was riddled with puncture wounds, the fleshy interior dry as a bone. Rigor mortis had practically torqued the poor bird's skeletal frame, making him resemble some avian spin on a fetal position. Strangely, despite the deep holes peppering Cornpop's flank, none of his feathers were missing, and there were no signs of any further ripping or tearing of his skin. It was completely incongruous for a predator. It was almost as if some vampiric beast had drained the rooster of his fluids, but Byron perished the thought. Chupacabras, assuming they were real, lived in the American Southwest, not the mountains of West Virginia. But what really drew Byron's attention was what lay around the corpse. A veritable grove of unfamiliar plants about shin height grew in a messy circle around Corn Pop's body like some vegetative vegan funeral ring. With their bruised purple stalks, wide, jagged leaves, and clusters of fruits that looked like black beans, they superficially resembled pokeweed. But Byron had cleared enough of that crap from his yard to know for certain that it, this wasn't pokeweed. Some kind of fast-growing plant that feeds off dead organic matter in the soil, maybe. He wondered, scratching the back of his head. Regardless, Corn Pop was dead as a doorknob, and to Byron, these weird, ugly weeds had sprung up solely to spite his memory. Still, morbid curiosity as to what exactly the plants were won out. Byron drew his multi-tool and sawed away at one of the purplish stalks. The leaves and berries shook like autumn trees in the wind from the tremors, and the gash from Byron's blade oozed inordinate amounts of beet-colored sap. Damn it! Byron growled as the sap dripped down his fingers. He finally wrenched the leafy chunk off the plant's base, leaving about six inches of stalk protruding from the soil. Even as he turned it over in his hand, it continued to bleed onto the ground. Byron gave a heavy sigh, the possibility of developing some horrid rash just then crossing his mind. But he'd had enough technu at home to scrub the plant-induced dermatitis off of a horse, so he didn't worry too much as he trudged back to the house. The bleeding, weeding fruit of his labors strangled in his fist. Later that evening, the plant was proving difficult, even post-amputation. Byron had plopped it upon his work table in the garage, a lamp shedding light on the subject, as he picked and prodded at it with various tools like a surgeon. He'd washed his hands and arms thoroughly beforehand, cleaning every bit of dark red juice off of his skin. So far, nothing itched or was inflamed, so he could only assume that he had scrubbed hard enough. Or maybe the bloody sap simply wasn't hazardous to his health. He didn't care either way. Using a pair of pliers, Byron plucked one of the fruits off the plant, observing it with his keen eye. Its resemblance to a black bean was truly uncanny. He was unsure even if he would be able to pick it out of a pile of beans. It was practically indistinguishable in every exterior detail. But what about the inside, he thought sardonically. He pressed the tip of the pliers into the fruit, feeling a surprising substance. Tough nut to crack, he muttered, applying more pressure. Jeez, he spat after a solid ten seconds without leaving so much as a dent in the fruit. He braced himself on the tabletop with his free hand and forced all his strength into it. His frustration, his confusion, his mounting grief over corn pop all concentrated on that single point. It burst. A jet of viscous black syrup sprayed from the fruit's crumpled form, splattering across Byron's knuckles and fingers. Oh, God, he exclaimed, trying to wipe it off on the tabletop. It merely stuck and smeared across his skin like a stubborn booger. It reeked, too, a metallic, pungent rot, like crushing a stink bug between his fingers. I don't have the time for this, he hissed, stumbling into the kitchen and drowning his hands under the faucet, scrubbing so hard he almost shaved off layers of skin. The oily residue was reluctant to come off, and Byron's hands were an angry red by the time he finally slowed down to take a look. His skin seemed clean, but a line of dirty blackness sat underneath his fingernails. Grumbling, he drew a blade from the knife rack and dug it under his nails, 
chiseling out tiny bits of gunk. After a few minutes of slow work, his zeal overtook him, and he dug too deep. A splinter of pain shot up the nail bed, and he seethed, clutching his fingertip, tears pinching at the corners of his eyes. Oh, screw this, he said, throwing the knife in the sink with a clatter. The damn plant, nebulous as it might have been, was simply not worth the trouble. It was nothing but a messy, inconvenient weed and a blooming herald of death. Corn Pop's dried carcass, a testament to that. The turmoil of the night, physical and mental, was too much. Still massaging his hand, Byron lumbered up the stairs to his lonely bed, collapsing upon it in his day clothes. In the morning, he vowed, he'd give Corn Pop the proper burial he deserved and tear up every single one of those treacherous plants. But for now, he would sleep. Several hours later, Byron shot awake with the worst pain of his life. He roused and screamed himself to lucidity, his left hand cramping and burning and flaring with insidious needles. He fumbled for the lamp on his nightstand, the afflicted hand spasming and shooting molten rods of agony up and down his arm and spine. What in the hell? He choked, finally switching on the light. Entangling himself from the sheets, he finally sat up on the side of his bed and took a look at his hands. He nearly screamed again. The flesh from his fingertips to his wrist was swollen and scarlet, blood vessels throbbing like parasitic worms, but it was the grass-like sprouts protruding from his skin that made his eyes pop. A dozen little green tendrils, three growing from under his fingernails. Even as he watched, wheezing against the pain, the sprouts curled in real time toward the beam of his lamp, eager to absorb the light along with the spongy nitrous bed of his flesh. Babbling incoherently, Byron jumped to his feet and staggered across the room where his multi-tool had been tossed upon a dresser drawer. He grabbed it and flicked the knife blade open. As he hurried back to the lamp, the pain under his nails intensified, tiny piercing lasers searing his fingertips, as if they knew what was about to happen. Byron retrieved his wallet from his pocket and bit down on it. The taste of leather was acrid that early in the morning, but it would distract him from the extra pain he knew he would endure. He started with the top of his hand first. His bones and tendons cried out in protest as he stabbed and scraped. His teeth finally punctured the leather. He could taste the plastic of his debit card. Bellowing through his clenched jaws, he finally flung a chunk of flesh off his hand and onto the carpet, taking a sprout with it. Blood bubbled from the incision, spilling down his forearm. But he wasn't done. Far from it. Oh, God, he cried, his voice muffled, moving onto number two. It was slow, agonizing work. He heard the blade scrape against bone more than enough times he ever wanted to hear in his life. Each successful extraction resulted in another stripe of red down his arm. At around number six, something in his mouth cracked. He was unsure if it was the debit card or a tooth. At number nine, he chanced to glance down at his feet. Bloody nuggets of meat littered the ground before him. I'm falling apart. I'm literally falling to pieces, he thought hysterically. But the sight of those little green sprouts among the bits spurred him further. This won't happen to me, he resolved, finally extracting number nine. That only left the three under his nails. The sprouts were practically dancing with panic, each gyrating motion radiating more excruciating pain. He growled in agony, the blade slipping under his nail, scratching the base of the bed, his brain going fuzzy. But eventually, he flung the sprout out from the nail. Two left, he sobbed. Come on, come on, you got this. The second to last one came out slightly easier, but by that time, his vision had gone blurry from tears. His hand looked like it had been skinned, shining and pumping with spilled vitality. You're dead, he choked, digging into the final sprout. It was difficult. His knife hand trembled. The blood was making the blade slip. Sheer exhaustion from the pain was making him woozy. The sucker was wedged deep in there. It wasn't coming out. There was only one way. Roaring in defiance, 
Byron raised the knife like a meat cleaver. For a crazy moment, he caught sight of his shadow casted on the wall, the hulking silhouette of an axe murderer about to dispatch his next victim. Then the blade came down. Byron screamed, the wallet flopping at his teeth. His fingertip hung off by a spare thread of phalange. Weeping shamelessly, he grabbed the appendage with his free hand and plucked it right off. He dropped it to the floor, nausea racking his guts. The sight of his own fingertip, detached from his body, several feet further from his hand than it should have, made him feel dizzy. It's rude to point, he mumbled, fighting a sick upheaval of laughter. Still, the last rational shred in his mind told him if he put the fingertip on ice, he could save it. And as he bent over to retrieve it, that last rational shred disintegrated. The sprout remained embedded in the flesh, but it was what was underneath it, protruding from the bloody grounded meat that made him scream again. Where what should have been roots was instead a tiny pale humanoid figure no longer than a nickel. But despite its size, Byron could see its tuberous limbs contorting and a porous, jawless mouth like a worm's opening and closing on its eyeless face. If it had a voice, it'd be crying like an infant fresh from the womb. The more Byron looked, the more he saw every chunk of his hand meat bore its own miniature homunculus, squirming in the cold air. There was blood everywhere. His babies were dying in puddles of his own blood. He could taste it in his mouth. No! Then he fainted. Byron awoke when the morning sun filtered through his bedroom window and washed across his face. His mouth tasted foul like rotten pennies. He pushed himself onto his hands and knees, his left hand throbbing with dull, bloodless pain. Shriveled bits of dry flesh lay discarded around him. There was no saving his severed fingertip. Yet he could see that his unwitting offspring hadn't survived either. The sprouts were mere hairs of deadwood. The bodies were desiccated slivers devoid of life. Byron grimaced and stood up. He wasn't hurting anywhere else. The infestation had to have been contained to his hand, where the black liquid stained his skin. Fresh rage boiled in his head. He'd carved up his own hand, crippling his ability to work around the farm to simply function as he wanted to, all because those goddamn plants and their diabolical seedlings. You've got to go, he shouted, stomping down the stairs to the garage. With his good hand, he grabbed his trusty shovel. All of them. The morning air was crisp and biting, but Byron pushed against it, anger eating his muscles. The rising sun lit the way, and in a few furious minutes, he found himself at his dead rooster's side for the second time. Dew glistened on his once lustrous feathers, and frost had crystallized on his beak. But the plague plants remained where they were, innocently soaking up the early sun. Byron gripped his shovel. The cold had numbed his injured hand. He trembled with fury. He'd uproot them and burn them, ensuring that their spawn could never take seed in himself, his fellow man, or any of other the God's creatures again. He drove the shovel at the base of the nearest plant. He scooped up nearly a gallon of dirt and tossed it aside. He aimed his blade, judging where the roots would be. No trace, he growled, stabbing downwards again. The ground before him exploded. A granulated storm of soil blasted Byron in the face, and he stumbled backward, dropping the shovel, coughing and wiping dirt from his eyes. And from the ground came a hoarse, rasping bellow. Byron watched, petrified, as the plant seemed to rise in the air. Then he saw it was growing from the head of some twisted, gnarled, earthen thing. A man-sized figure made entirely of roots and tubers, with fibrous muscles and twig-like fingers, its wrinkly, eyeless face bearing a gaping hole of a mouth that emitted a rattling breath. It emerged from the cavity, lurching like a marionette, spindly hands extended toward Byron's throat. Instinct took over and he smacked at the thing's arm. It was like slapping a tree trunk. 
His palm flared with pain, and he ducked out of the way. Strifing to the right, he barely avoided the creature's hateful embrace. But it turned blindly towards him, giving a ghostly, breathy shriek that pierced his eardrums. Byron screamed back in a vain attempt to block out the horrible noise. He grabbed the discarded shovel and swung wildly. The blade struck the thing's side, its filthy brown hide cracked, revealing whitish-green insides like freshly cut branches. But it lashed out in return, a thorny finger grazing Byron's face, leaving a collection of stinging gashes across his cheek. "'No, you don't!' he cried, swinging the shovel over his head and bringing it down upon the thing's scalp. Its floral crown snapped as the blade made contact, and the beet-red sap dribbled down the creature's face and body. Byron, wretched, disgusted at the bloody display, but the thing was disoriented. He slashed and hacked at it, laughing at the top of his lungs, chopping great chunks off its body until it fell to the ground. Whining, the creature's fingers snaked to his ankle, coiling around him like spiky tentacles. But Byron wrenched himself free and drove the shovel into its neck. With a gristly crunch, its head separated from its shoulders. A woody vegetative scent filled the air. The creature's corpse gave a few more twitches, but it fell still after a moment. The mangled stem atop its head still oozed sap. Byron dropped the shovel, his hands throbbing, his muscles completely spent. He nearly collapsed from exhaustion. The sunlight seemed to dim. He realized he was coming down from an adrenaline high. The weight of what he'd endured settled in next. A complete perversion of nature. A mocking defiance of all that he knew. One with a grisly life cycle and a disturbingly human countenance. It was then that he looked around and his stomach dropped. They were everywhere, not just around Corn Pop's body. Everywhere he looked, those same weedy plants bloomed from the ground, malicious in their innocence. How long have they been here, said Byron? Had they grown overnight, or was he just starting to notice them after his traumatic encounter? Regardless, Byron was tired and sore. Taking down one of those creatures had been draining enough, and he was surrounded. His left hand flared again. If he'd gotten any more of that terrible, horrible fluid on his bare skin... To hell with that, he whispered, treading carefully away from his rooster's corpse and weaving around the crowding plants. He couldn't stay here. He couldn't risk it again. He needed to get away from the farm for a while. Only one safe haven came to mind, the one place all good sons went to when they were scared and confused. His hand cleaned and bandaged up, Byron tried clearing his head as he drove down the country road to his mother's house. But the further he went, the more the pieces came together against his will. Like all plants, they reproduced via the fruiting bodies that bloomed from their exposed stems. And ideally, an animal, squirrel, deer, rooster, whatever, would eat the fruits. But rather than soil, the seeds required the meat of its host to germinate, and they would sprout sending their roots throughout the victim's insides, eventually emerging from its body like grass in an ash field. Once mature, or when the host was completely drained of nutrients, whichever came first, they'd escape their fleshy prisons as immature adolescents, find a place in the ground to take root and grow into their gnarled adult forms. The sprouts from their heads would eventually flower and produce fruits, and the cycle would repeat. Ideally, they remained sequestered within a host's internal organs to grow in safety. Byron regarded his injured hand, remembering an anecdote from his youth. A woman had been scratched on the arm by a cat, whose claw had unwittingly transferred the egg of an intestinal parasite into the wound. The egg hatched and grew into a worm, but without its expected environment of a warm, cozy gut, the worm struggled and suffered, eventually perishing under her skin. The point was, it could have been a lot worse. Byron shuddered at the thought. But he finally found safety and relief as he pulled into his mother's driveway and strode up to the front door, knocking in a rhythmic tune. Her old, familiar face peeked through the cracked door. Hello, she said. 
Who are you? It's me, your son, Byron. Byron counted down how long it would take to set in. Oh, she finally said. She threw the door open and hugged him. Byron grimaced. Six seconds, he thought. A slight improvement from the last time's eight. What a wonderful surprise. Come in, come in, she said, shuffling into her kitchen. I'll make chili for supper. Byron gave a half-hearted smile. Mom's special chili had been a staple since he was in diapers, but over the years its quality had slipped along with her mental state. Still, a warm home-cooked meal was leagues more inviting than anything that loomed back at his place. Oh, Byron, what happened to your hand? His mom was lugging a large pot over to the stovetop, but she'd stopped peering over the rim with shock. Oh, farm equipment, he replied. Oh, dear, that's nasty business, she commented, settling the pot down with a clang. For the next hour, his mother milled about the kitchen, preparing ingredients with varying degrees of clumsiness. Byron sat at the table and let the savory tang of peppers and tomato sauce defog the turmoil in his brain. Dispatching the creatures with a shovel was effective, but wasteful. He knew his mother had a shed's worth of weed killer out back. He wondered if good old-fashioned chemical poisoning would do the trick. It was much less intrusive, therefore much less risk of bursting one of those black fruits. Soup's up, his mother finally decried, placing two steaming bowls on the table. Oh, Byron, what happened to your hand? He gave a sad sigh. Farm equipment. Oh, dear, that's nasty business. As he predicted, the chili was thin and overloaded with red pepper, but he cherished it nonetheless. For the first time since the afternoon before, he felt a tiny bit content. Yet his troubles must have shown on his face. His mother watched him and pursed her lips, shaking her head. Is the chili not you liking? Oh, it's good, Mom, said Byron. Tastes kind of funny, she said, dripping a spoonful back into her bowl. Next time, I won't use black beans. Byron looked up. You put beans in this? The darndest thing, she said, looking away wistfully. I found a whole bunch of black bean plants growing in the yard this morning. I thought they'd add a nice bit of starch. Byron glanced down at his half-empty bowl. He blinked hard and cleared his throat. Something churned in his stomach. His spoon clattered on the table. Is everything all right, dear? His mother asked. Byron wiped his mouth with a trembling hand. Sure, he settled with. All things considered, the chili wasn't terrible, but he wondered if he could chase it down with some of that weed killer in the shed out back. I hope you enjoyed Ben Dragora by Nick Carlson as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented featured author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash nick dash carlson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash n-i-c-k dash c-a-r-l-s-o-n. You can read more at creepypastastories.com, purchase his book, Hell's Gulf, from Amazon, or visit his latest info at nickcarlsonpress.com. In fact, why not do all three? Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. I'd like to remind you one last time that all of tonight's featured authors can be found by visiting our website, Thanks again for your support of this show and for all of tonight's featured authors. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, 
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive uh, dating back to 2012. All of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyrie. Stay tuned as this season's just getting started. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, Do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.